And so I'm going to look tonight at um, a well-known parable uh, in Luke 15. It's, it's known as the parable of the, as, of the lost son or the prodigal son. And uh, someone was telling me this morning, we've just looked at that in our growth group. And that's, that's amazing. Um, and I'm actually going to split this parable into three different messages. And uh, we're going to look at the father. We're going to look at the older brother. I don't know how many of you have got older brothers, but I have an older brother. And uh, we're going to look at the, the younger brother in that order. Um, so next week when I share, and then actually it'll probably be in the new year I share uh, about the younger brother. But these will stand alone and it'll make sense as we, we go in. But I do want to read the whole parable to you. So in Luke 15, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's one of the longest stories Jesus told. So, uh, so bear with, but it's worth hearing. So here we go. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to feel, fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his, arms, threw his, uh, to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When they came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he uh, is back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with uh, wild living, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's a great story. Jesus is a great storyteller. And um, as you read this, you might notice there are actually two that were upset that the younger son had come home. One was the older brother, right? And the other one was the fatted calf. I'm sure he was listening to all that going, I'm sure he said KFC. I'm sure he said go get the chicken in. But anyway... We'll move on. What I want to look at for the next sort of 20 minutes is to focus in on the father's love. Because we would say, oh, this is the story of the prodigal son, right? But um, it's actually the story of the father's love towards two sons. It's not just about this young wayward boy. It's about the father's love towards two sons. And so we're going to focus right in to the Father, and I want to introduce you to who Father God is. I don't know if you've ever met him. 
I don't know if you've had the opportunity to ask him into your life to say, yes, I want him in my life. But this evening, I want to say to you, this is who God is. He is this amazing father. And we get a picture of him because Jesus, in telling this story, highlights several aspects and characteristics of who God is. So if you were trying to describe to somebody who is Keith Jackson, you might say, well, he's got a would-be beard. It's not quite a full beard, but he's got a little bit of a beard and he's a bit porky and he's, he's got a really bad taste in jumpers. And you might say all of those kind of things. You might highlight qualities to, dr- to try and describe me to others. But Jesus, in telling this story, tells us who God is and what he's like. And there are lots of things. And I'm just going to try and fly through these a little bit. The first thing I want you to know is Father God is loving. He's loving. The younger son says to his father, this is what the Bible says, give me my share of the estate. Now, when Jesus is telling this story, everyone listening to that would have been said, and the father said, dush, get out to the field, son. Don't muck around, right? Because that was not normal. It was not normal. In fact, in the Jewish culture, you would only get your share of an estate upon death. And the older son would get the majority. They would get what was called the double portion. So the older son in this would get two-thirds of the estate. And the younger son would get one-third of the estate. But to actually go to the father and say, give me my share now, he was saying, I wish you were dead. I don't want anything to do with you. I wish you were dead. And so everyone listening is thinking the response of that father is going to be discipline. He's going to give him, you know, capital punishment. Well, not capital punishment. He's going, to, he's going to get the rod out and he's going to beat him. He's going to do all this. But what we read is, so the father divided his property between them. Wow. And everyone would have sat like you, silent. They would have gone, what? Did we hear that correctly? You see, he's loving He was able to say, despite the audacity and the ignorance of the request, the Father granted it. I want you to know tonight, if you don't know who God is and you're thinking, what's he like? His first characteristic is that he's loving even when we're not. He's loving towards us even when we don't love him. The Bible tells us that whilst we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us. He loves us even when we don't love him. He loves us even when at times we turn our back on him. I want you to know tonight, God loves you. He loves you. This is his default setting. He loves you. The second thing that we discover in this story as we were to read through it is that Father God can be trusted you can trust him. You see, we read in there, this, this young boy goes off and he wastes all this money and he spends it all on wild living and all that kind of thing and he gets himself into a right pickle and we will look at his attitude and what God does in his life. But he says this, he says, I will set out and go where? I'll go back to my father. Jesus is saying, you can come back to God. And he gets all this speech ready, and he gets all these things done. And the Bible says in verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. I don't know how low you have to go before you turn back to God. (laughs) How low do you have to go? This young man went the lowest a Jewish boy could could go. If If you were listening to this story as Jesus was telling it, each stage, um, and when I, when I come to this, I'll speak about his five humiliating experiences. They're amazing experiences. Everyone, if you were listening to it for the first time, and you heard, oh, oh no, he, he, he took his inheritance and went off. Oh, no, he, he, he wasted it all on, on, on women of ill repute, as we used to say back in the day. He did all this wild living. Oh, oh, oh no, he sold himself into slavery. Oh, no, he's feeding pigs. You'd cringe at every level. You'd be going, this cannot, this cannot get any worse. How desperate do we have to be before we'll turn back like him and say, I'll go back to my father. I'll go back to my father. Tonight, the invitation is we're going to respond in some worship. is no matter where you are in life, you can return to your father because he, he can be trusted. 
The only one the son was left to trust was dad. The only one he could go back to was him. And so he gets up and he goes to his father. He's going to throw himself on his mercy. He can be trusted. You can trust him today. And then there's this amazing thing. The Father God is looking for you. He's looking for you. It says, while the son was a long way off, and he's a right state, remember, he hasn't bathed, he hasn't washed, he's, he's unclean, he's in rags and all this. And on, the, 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 excuse my sort of uh, portraying this in this way, but Father's sitting on his porch every day, sitting on the porch, looking at the horizon, and he sees a speck, and he looks, and he, can, he doesn't even know he's in rags, he's too far away. He doesn't know, but there's something in the way that person is walking. You see, Father is looking for you tonight. He's looking for you. He's looking for that heart that gets soft before him. We call that softness, that turning to God, we call it repentance. The, the Greek word for repentance is this strange word, it's metanoia, that's the word in the Bible. And what it means, it's a military term, it's as though when an army is marching in one direction and they metanoia, what does it mean? It means they turn around and they go in the opposite direction. It's a change of mind and it's a change of direction. It's walking away from what you currently have but it's walking towards God it's turning to him and walking towards see we always think about repentance and change of being oh I, the things I don't do the things I've given up for Jesus the things that make me you know that I used to enjoy we we'd sometimes think in church all the things we used to love doing we're not allowed to do anymore and we turn away from those things but actually the act of repentance isn't just turning away it's turning towards it's turning towards God and God is looking for hearts that will be soft before him this evening Hearts that are changing their direction. Hearts that will say, I'm going to walk towards God. I may not know everything about him. I may not fully understand him. And, and I've been a Christian now 44 years. I can tell you, there are two people in my life that I don't fully understand, but I thoroughly enjoy learning new things about. In reverse order, they are my wife. It, it, a woman is a mystery, it really is a mystery to me and my wife is a mystery and I love her. She might watch this back, the recording, and uh, I love my wife desperately. But then there'll be things after 36 years of marriage that I still discover about her. I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. Never knew that. Still discovering. But even more, I don't understand God. I know him, I love him, I have a relationship with him. I'm trying to describe to you how wonderful he is this morning, but if you, uh, this evening, but if you were to say to me, you know, uh, what is God like in this? I, it's a mystery and it, it's unveiling every day for the last 44 years. But I do know this, he's looking at my heart. He's looking to see what I am facing, what I am worshipping, where I'm putting my priorities. And tonight God would say to us from Psalm 51, it says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. He's looking for that. And then something else amazing in this, if you were listening to this story for the first time, you'd be amazed by this, because Jesus says he runs. God runs towards you. When he sees that softness, he's attracted to it. When he sees that repentant heart, he's attracted to it. And it says, we, we just read it, and he ran to his son. Now, you need to understand, this was not dignified behavior. I mean, when I've not seen my boys for a long time, and to be fair, I'm British, so I'm very, very reserved in my emotions, you understand. You might say I'm emotionally stunted. So I might go up to them, all right, lad, slap him on the back. You're right, son. Yes, lad, I'm all right. You know, all that kind of thing. You know, wait until the women folk left the room, then we hug. Yeah, you know. But we're, we're kind of, you know, emotionally pent up. The Jewish, even more. 
There are even more. And when it says that he ran to him, you have to picture this in your mind because they, would, they wouldn't be wearing their jeans and their Chelsea boots and all the rest of it. They would be in their robes. And so that meant to run the father had to hitch up his robes. The Bible talks about girding up the loins of your mind. This is the idea. And you, 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 he would have to hitch it up and tuck it into his underwear. Yes, you heard that right. Into his underwear. And then he would run. And the picture of that was like, well, that's the most undignified thing I will ever seen in my life. Why would he do that? And the father runs to the horizon and grabs up his son and proclaims he is alive. He is alive. This, this evening, if you want to meet with God, I want you to know God's running already. <laughs> He's already running towards you. Say, oh, Keith, I don't like that picture. I prefer God sitting on a throne with his white beard and, and all those kind of things. But actually, God wants to run to you. He wants to meet you. He wants to spend time with you. You are the apple of his eyes looking on that horizon. And he sees your heart and saying, uh, in worship and as you come, he's going to run towards you. God doesn't wait for us to go all the way. So many people will say to me, oh, I can't be baptized, I'm not good enough, I can't be this, I'm not a good enough Christian, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the other. How ready do you have to be? How clean do you have to be? You know, when a fisherman is fishing, I can't fish, by the way, in case you're wondering, the level of my fishing is Churchill's Fish and Chip Shop, and Stan, but... I'm not very good at fishing. And, um, and so, but when, when the fisherman is fishing, he doesn't clean the fish before the fish is in the boat. When God is calling you back, he doesn't say to you, you've got to clean yourself. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is what Jesus has already done for us. He's done all the work. He's done everything we could not do. And the only thing I bring to him is my brokenness, my hurt, my sin, and my pain. That's the only thing I've got to offer him, and I bring that to him, and he changes it all. That's the amazing thing. And when God runs to you, he's not, he's not going to say, stand there, see you on the horizon, going, oh, come on then, make your pay, make that walk of shame really long. He doesn't do that. He takes your undignified state and runs to you. And embraces you. He makes the first move towards us by sending Jesus. None of us really take the first step. But when we turn our hearts to him, we discover that God, Father God, is forgiving. We see this whole thing played out in front of our eyes in this parable. He shouts to his, uh, to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf, not the KFC, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate because he was dead and now he's alive. And all that speech that was prepared by that son is lost. He begins it, he doesn't finish it. It's lost because God, his love, his forgiveness overwhelms us. Now, what is all this about? He gives him the best robe. Well, you, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about this. Whose robe is that? Well, he's already given him a third of the estate. And he says to the other son, everything I have is yours. The only thing that the father really had was his robe. Whose robe does he give him? He gives him his own robe. The father gives the, the son his own robe. And actually, in, in, in the culture of the day, the, the colors of the robe would depict which family you belong to. So what's the father doing? He's saying, you're part of the family. So the first thing God does when we experience his forgiveness is he, you may not understand it, but you're now adopted. You're back. You're alive. You're part of the family. He puts a ring on his finger, which in those days would speak of authority. They would have signet rings. And he puts this on. He says, everywhere you go now, you carry my authority. You carry something of me that you can seal things as though you can loose things. You can do this because you have the authority. He puts sandals on his feet. Ever wondered about that? I don't know if he had socks on as well. It's a big debate in my house whether it's acceptable to wear sandals and socks at the same time. Can we take a vote on that? Who is for 
sandals with socks. Oh, who is against sandals? Oh, I think it's about 50-50. Barbie, if you're watching this online, oh, thank you, Jesus. I've got, got no, my wife hates, hates sandals with socks. But it's my secret vice. It's, they're so comfortable when you put socks on, right? There are some cultures where they would only wear sandals with their socks, I don't, uh, or socks with their sandals. So I don't know if he had socks on. But why does he give him sandals? He gives him sandals because slaves did not wear sandals. Slaves went barefoot. So by putting sandals on his feet, he's saying you're not a slave. Did you get that? He's saying you're not a slave. You're no longer, if you, if you experience God's forgiveness, you're no longer a slave to the things of the past and your past mistakes and your sins and the things that kept you away from God. God puts something on you to say you are free. And he holds a celebration feast. All this is wonderful news. But then we discover the father intervenes. He intervenes. The older brother, it says, became angry and refused to go in. We'll talk about the older brother more next time, but I want you to know, it doesn't matter how undignified you get, we don't have an older brother spirit in this church. And what I mean by that is we don't judge people. We don't look at people and say, oh, they're not worthy of being a Christian. We don't look at people and say, oh, they should have done better. They shouldn't have done those things that got them into trouble. We don't look at people like that because all of us, the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God's standards, all of us. And all of us who have experienced God's forgiveness understand. But God even intervenes in that. God prepares the hearts of his church to welcome everyone else back. So as I wrap this up, we're going to enter into a time of, of worship. But I want you to know, if you feel far from God tonight, right now where you are, and you might have been a Christian a long time, you may never have met him, but I want you to know you can meet with him afresh. He is about to rejoice over you and proclaim you're alive. He's about to run to you. He's about to lavish you with things that you won't even understand as you're worshiping. But he wants you. He wants you. I don't know if you came here tonight with this massive desire. Come on, team. Come on. I don't, I'm, I'm going to end up waffling. I don't know if you had this massive desire to meet with God tonight. But I can tell you God's desire to meet with you is far greater. He is a wonderful father. When I became a Christian and uh, many years ago, and they said to me, oh, God is the perfect father. I had no idea what a father was. I didn't really grow up in a household where we had fathers uh, or a father. Uh, there were lots of men, but that's not the same thing. And so I had to learn. And this parable was one of the key things that helped me understand how much God loves me. And here I am, 44 years later, still saying the same things about God. Do you want to encounter the loving God tonight? Oh, I hope so. Do you want to encounter the God who can be trusted? The God who's looking for you? The God who runs to you? The God who forgives you? The God who lavishes things on you? That, the blessings that you don't even understand. The blessings of being forgiven and part of the family. Let's worship. We're going to spend some time. Uh, we've got plenty of time to worship and you know, um, we don't know how long we'll worship for, where the response will go. But are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to meet him? My description of him tonight was really not that detailed. Pale into comparison of who he is. Do you want to meet him who is the divine mystery? The father who loves you. Let's stand if you're able. And as Aaron has already said, there's plenty of space. And we can worship God together. Lord, we want to meet you. And in one sense, Lord, we, we all admit our failure and our wanderings and we've moved away from you. Lord, we've taken a step and now we ask you to run to meet us. Come run, Lord. Come embrace us. Lord, we need you. Lord, it's as though we have been out in the cold. We have been, we bring rags and dirt and mess and 
tiredness and sin and brokenness and pain and we bring all of that and we look to your embrace and we look to you Lord to come and to reignite us and to wash away our sin once more in Jesus name Amen